is uh, for uh, transformed computer, uh, no, computer transformed clarinet sounds. So I played various clarinet sounds and actually voice sounds, some of them too, and some are percussion sounds, like uh, we've got a fairly adequate percussion instrument here. that isn't great, but when you record it, it can be like a giant Chinese gong. Well, and this too, the humble high pan in itself is very humble. But not unlike a Chinese cymbal. Uh, but when you record it, then you can transform it into a beautiful gong sound. So this piece, consists of a series of interludes and one one movement, one minute movements, uh, six of them. And each one mm, features a different kind of effect. The first one uses the Harmon mute. And normally you can't use that on a clarinet because your hands are both busy. But if you use the half clarinet, then you've got the, a hand to manipulate things. So, that's what starts out the piece. And this has been uh, transformed on the tape too. I played, uh, Roughly speaking, I'll play a 30-second sort of ritual seed planting, planting the seeds of the sound that then for one minute will be explored on the tape by transforming them electronically. And then with them, I'll add the clarinet part. Um, I called it Sumie because on my computer, it looked like a black and white Japanese painting, which is a sumi. A is picture and sumi is black, and they call it sumi A. Uh, so it's sort of a black and white picture with six seed plantings and six flowerings of the electronic transformations of sound. Oh, and I've used another mute I've used. Uh, is the humble PVC. I like humble mutes. The, the, the Harmon costs a fortune. I'm glad I don't have many mutes like that, but PVC costs a nickel. You know. And my pie pan, I think, is a dime, you know, so it's very practical. Okay.
Thank you very much. The next uh, piece is uh, for a trio of clarinets called Emerald City Rag. The Emerald City part is for Seattle. The rag is for New Orleans. Um, thanks to uh, many of your ragtime piano players and ragtime instrumentalists of all types. Anyway, it's not supposed to be jazz, uh, but there are influences from early jazz. And I'm very happy that John Reeks is performing it with his trio. They did it here last year, I think. And uh, have I got the order wrong? Is that right, John? Pardon? Okay, I wasn't sure I had the order Except right. in New Orleans, we're going to make it into the Emerald City. Emerald City, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs>
epitaphs are for double clarinet, again, but of a, uh, a kind that uses the entire clarinet. And for this, the buffet company very kindly uh, constructed a left-hand double clarinet, which is guaranteed not to sell like hotcakes, but <laughs> they're, they're very generous. I mean, yesterday they gave the students 10 buffet clarinets. I think that wasn't me. Anyway, uh, I wanted to uh, write some pieces for this new that uh, w what the buffet company did is fill the holes on the top part of the clarinet, make an extension of the octave key, and add a C sharp key that I can reach with my left hand. Because you see, this this clarinet, I play the, the normal fingering for the, the lower half of the clarinet. This clarinet, I play the normal fingerings for the upper half. Um, I have to, can't resist telling you a myth about the creation of the clarinet that the goddess Athena uh, was by a pond one day and she saw some cane and thought she'd take the cane and make a little whistle out of it, or a reed pipe. Then she took two cane, pieces of cane, and made sounds on them. And she played the first double pipe instrument, which was like playing two clarinets at once. So this, you see, this is nothing new at all. Um, of course, that's a myth. but. The myth continues that her handmaidens told Athena that she looked ugly when she played her allos. And so she looked in the pond, and sure enough, it, her cheeks puffed out, and she didn't look good. So she threw it to earth, and it was found by an earthling, Martius, and he became the Earth's first double pipe player. And he thought he was so good that he can com could compete with the god Apollo and challenged Apollo to a duel. Well, Apollo played a liar, of course. And being a god, he was not really allowed to lose, but Marcius didn't realize that. And so he fearlessly challenged him they played their competition, judged by the god who, who, who everything he touched turned to gold. What's his name again? Midas. What? Midas. Midas. Got a kid. Midas. Anyway, yes, that god. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you because you're doing counterpoint. That's all right. Midas, yes, King Midas touch. <laughs> so if he touched my clarinet, I'd be real lucky. Uh, so anyway, King Midas was the judge, and he judged that Marcius was the best. And his advisor said, well, you can't do that. Uh, Marcius is just an earthling, and Apollo's a god. So they told the performers told Apollo and Marcius that they had to reverse their instruments and play them. Well, for the lyre, that was no big deal. You could just turn the lyre around and still play beautifully. But for the allos, it was impossible. So he lost. And he was flayed alive. And still today in Italy, you can see uh, sculptures of Poor old Marcius flayed alive on his tree. Uh, it's kind of a sad story, but 
The fact is that instrument became the most important Greek instrument and was used, was the only instrument, the, the double pipe, the alos, was the only mis instrument allowed to play for the Greek theater. He was the choral director and taught the chorus their sounds and their moves and played his alos. So anyway, as I've continued, I didn't know any of this when I started. I just saw some pictures of people playing double pipes in Greece, and I thought, oh, that'd be nice to do. But then I wrote the pieces for uh, the double clarinet with the two halves, and then I wrote pieces for the double clarinet with uh, entire clarinets. For that, I need a support for one of the clarinets. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate to use texts by an ancient Greek author. And these are written by Anite of Tegea, who was in ancient Greece considered to be almost like Homer, you know, a great writer. But she only was, the only things we're left with are 24 epitaphs. And I'm gonna play for you four of them tonight with my modern version of the instrument Athena invented. <clears throat> Antibia. I mourn the lady Antibia through the fame of both beauty and wisdom and to the young men came to her father's house. Fate, the destroyer, rolls hope. A soldier, the earth of Lydia holds Amintor, Philip's son. He gained many things in iron battle. No sickness led him to the house of night. He died holding his round shield before his friend. Thank you. 
No more exulting in the calm sea shall I rise from the depths and thrust through the waves. No more shall I rush past the beautiful prow of a fair rowlocked ship, delighting in the figurehead. The dark waters of the sea dash me to land, and I lie here upon this narrow shore. fortunate to have a wonderful bass player with me for this next number, Josh Guzzi. I've never met Josh before this week, and uh, I told John I needed a bass player for the duet I wrote called Blues for New Orleans, and he said he had just the man who could both play jazz and read and would be perfect to work with. And he was right, and I, I appreciate it. Yeah, and let, let's give him a hand even before. <laughs> See, this, this piece that I wrote uh, is a blues in the most liberal sense of the world, word, because it, it is 12 bars long, which is common to most blues, and it does have within it the one and the four and the five chords, which is common to just about all blues. But in between, other than that, none of the chords are closely related. They're all distant chords. Um, I don't want to bore you with this, a technical explanation, but let's say it's a very hard piece to play. And uh, Josh picked up on it right away, and I hope maybe, maybe you'll like it.
many students, uh, uh, music students in New Orleans. One of the reasons for this, this week of residency was to raise the, the awareness of the clarinet in New Orleans music history, both his, historically and looking towards the future, and he certainly has done that in the short time he's been with us. Um, I'd also like to thank John Snyder and the Loyola Center for, for Music and Fine Arts Entrepreneurship for their sponsorship and funding of this event. And I'd like to sponsor, uh, thank the other sponsor, the Buffet uh, Crampon Corporation, for um, their incredibly generous donation of 10 clarinets that went to divert deserving uh, beginning clarinet students in New Orleans, the future of New Orleans music on the clarinet. Thank you all for coming.